G'day, and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2023 Heater Knights of Slanash Battle Tome. In this video, I'm going to offer you the temptations of Slanash and put you in a lured haze by offering you the allegiance abilities, the grand strategies, the enhancements, the battle tactics, all the things that you need to know about the new Heater Knights of Slanash Battle Tome. Now, Games Workshop did send me this book in advance, but they won't see the video before it goes live. And as always, the book is chock full of art, narrative gems, path to glory, and your unique code to unlock the book in the AOS app. Let's start at the Allegiance level, and you have three hosts of the Dark Prince, which are your sub-factions being Invaders, Pretenders, and Godseekers. The expansion sub-factions like the Lured Haze didn't make it across into the new book. Now when we get to the preview of these three hosts of the Dark Prince, you will notice that the spell law is incorporated into your sub-faction choice, so there is no law of Slanash, law of pleasure and pain, or law of the forbidden sorcerers of Slanash. You've also lost Locus of Diversion, which was that dice roll that would stop an enemy from piling in. Through the Legions of Chaos, you are still able to bring Coalition units, and you can never take Coalition units with the keyword Corn. Two in every four units in the army can be Coalition from the Slaves to Darkness faction, as long as it has the Mark of Chaos keyword, and it must be given the Slanash keyword. So this might be your War Shrine, your Chaos Warriors, your Chosen, or your Varangard, just to name a few. One in every four units in the army can be coalition units from the Beasts of Chaos faction, as long as it doesn't have the Zinch or the Slanesh keywords, and they will gain the Slanesh keyword. So you wouldn't be able to bring in any units of the Zangor, but you could bring in, let's say, a Gorgon or a Bulgor to name a few. If you're unfamiliar with the term coalition units, they aren't allies, which means you can give them enhancements like artifacts, and you can choose units that are worth more than 400 points, Normally you'd be restricted with the amount of points you can spend on your allies, but given their coalition units, uh, it's very different. What you lost in the Locus of Diversion, you've gained in the Temptations of Slanesh, which might be my favorite faction ability in the entire AOS. At the start of each battle round, after determining who will take the first turn, you, the Slanesh player, gain a pool of six dice. These are your Temptation dice. Now, each time your opponent makes a failed hit roll, a failed wound roll, or a failed save roll, you can offer them a temptation dice. If they accept your offer, the roll is replaced with a six. Rolls replaced in this way cannot be re-rolled or modified. So now here's the cherry on top. Each time your opponent accepts the offer of a temptation dice, you gain d6 depravity points. Each time your opponent rejects the offer of a temptation dice, the unit for which the roll was made suffers D3 mortal wounds after all the attacks have been resolved. You cannot offer your opponent a temptation dice for the same enemy unit more than once per phase. And at the end of the battle round, any temptation dice that have not been offered are lost. This rule alone is making me want to play Slanesh. It's thematical to the lore, it has some great uses in-game by offering a 6 to a low value attack to generate depravity, or if they don't accept, they're going to take damage. Now if your opponent wants to accept 3 of those temptation dice, you're looking at about an average 10 depravity points, and if they were to accept all 6 of your temptation dice through the battle round, you're looking at an average 21 depravity points. Euphoric Killers, once per turn at the start of your combat phase, you can pick one enemy Heater Knights of Slanesh unit and one enemy unit within one inch of that unit. If you do so, until the end of that phase, you gain one depravity point for each wound and mortal wound caused by attacks made by that friendly unit that were allocated to the enemy unit. This used to generate extra attacks on unmodified hit rolls of six for Heater Knight units. Use your charisma to tempt your opponent into accepting the temptation dice and use your wit to choose the most valuable combats for euphoric killers and you will rack up some serious depravity points. Now you can also boost up your depravity points in other ways through spells, uh, the Keeper of Secrets, the Mesmerizing Mirror for example. 
Now you've collected all your depravity points, it's time to revel in depravity. The rules have been kept from the White Dwarf expansion, although it used to be called Revel in Pain. The ability name wasn't the only change, and you will see both the value and some of the abilities changing. Friendly Hedonites of Slanesh units will gain abilities based on the number of depravity points you have generated, and these abilities are going to accumulate throughout the game. When you have 12 depravity, you will subtract 1 from hit rolls for attacks that target friendly Hedonites of Slanesh units. With 24 or more depravity, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack with a melee weapon by a friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh unit is a 6, that attack will cause one mortal wound to the target in addition to any damage it would inflict. And at 36 or more depravity, friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh units will have a ward of 5+. You can summon Heed Knights of Slanesh Demon units to the battlefield if you've collected enough depravity points. If you have any depravity points at the end of your movement phase, you can summon one unit from the list below to the battlefield and add it to your army. Each unit you summon costs the number of depravity points shown on the list, and you can only summon them if you have enough depravity points to do so. When you summon them, you set them up more than 9 inches from all enemy units and wholly within 12 inches of a friendly Heed Knights of Slanash hero. You can summon a Keeper of Secrets for 36 Depravity, a Fiend unit with 3 models for 30, a Blade Bringer for 30, a Contorted Epitome for 30, a Seeker unit with 5 models for 24, a Chariot of Slanash for 24, an Infernal Raptress for 18, a Vice Leader for 18, or a unit of 10 demonettes for 18 points. Not only has the value increased to match the new depravity, but you have lost some of those larger blocks of demonettes. You could bring in 20 or 30 through a summon. Uh, the Blade Bringer and the Chariot of Slanesh are keywords, so I imagine you can bring in the variants like the Hell Flayer, the Seeker Chariot, or the Exalted Chariot. With Revel in Depravity, you might not want to summon a unit until you've at least exceeded 24 Depravity to get those mortal wounds, but really it'll be matchup dependent on what you need at the time. Let's look at the three hosts of the Dark Prince, starting with Invaders. You get two battle traits as well as access to three command traits, three artifacts, and three spells. With Figureheads of the Dark Prince, all friendly Invaders heroes are treated as general, even if they are not the model picked to be the general. In addition, roll the dice each time you pick a friendly Invaders hero to carry out a heroic action. On a 2+, plus, you can pick one other eligible Invaders hero on the battlefield to also carry out that heroic action. Escalating Havoc is a heroic action that you can carry out with one Invader's hero instead of picking from the generic core table. If you do so, pick one eligible command trait from the list on the Invader's sheet that the Invader's hero doesn't already have. Now that hero is considered to have that command trait until the end of the turn. Speaking of command traits, here are your three Invader's command traits. Best of the best lets you add one to the attack characteristic of a general's melee weapon while they're within six inches of a different hero. Glory Hog at the end of the combat phase if any enemy units were destroyed in that phase and this general is on the battlefield, you receive one command point. And with Hurler of Obscenities, at the start of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within six inches of the general. Until the end of that phase, add one to the hit rolls for attacks made by that unit, but subtract one to the save rolls for attacks that target that unit. Sacred Spoils of War are your artifacts of power for invaders heroes only. With the Rod of Misrule, keep track of the number of unmodified hit rolls of 6 and unmodified wound rolls of 6 for attacks made by the bearer in each turn. Now at the end of the battle shock phase, if the total is 6 or more and the bearer is on the battlefield, you gain 1 depravity point. Icon of Infinite Excess, once per battle at the start of the combat phase, you can say that the bearer will plant the Icon of Infinite Excess. If you do so, add 1 to the attack characteristic of weapons used by friendly Hedonites of Slanesh units on the battlefield until the end of that phase. 
Then the beguiling gem at the start of the combat phase, pick one enemy hero within three inches of the bearer and roll 3d6. If the roll is greater than the hero's bravery characteristic, subtract one from the attack characteristics of that hero's melee weapons to a minimum of one until the end of that phase. Finally, you have the Law of the Spoilers, and that is your spell law for invaders' wizards, including unique wizards only. Lash of Slanesh has a casting value of 6 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster and roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit. For each 5 plus, subtract 1 from the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapons to a minimum of 1 until your next hero phase. Parvain of Slanesh has a casting value of 6 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster, and roll a number of dice equal to that unit's movement characteristic. For each 5+, plus, subtract 1 inch from that unit's movement characteristic to a minimum of 1 for the rest of the battle. The same unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once per battle. The last spell is Hysterical Frenzy that has a casting value of 7 and a range of 18. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster, and roll a number of dice equal to that unit's bravery characteristic. For each 6, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So if I was running an invader's army, I'm initially drawn to the Hurlers of Obscenity Command Trait, the Icon of Infinite Excess Artifact, and the Hysterical Frenzy as my first spell choice on the list. Hurler of Obscenities will essentially give me another point of Rend that will make my Keeper of Secrets Paling Claws, for example, Rend minus three. Icon of Infinite Excess once per battle will give all of my Heed Knight of Slanesh units an extra attack with no range limit. And Hysterical Frenzy has a generous range of 18 inches and statistically should do 1 to 2 D3 worth of mortal wounds. Next up is the Pretenders and they have their own battle traits as well as 3 command traits, 3 artifacts and 3 spells to choose from. With your battle traits, Heir to the Throne, if the model picked to be your general is a Pretenders hero, you receive three command points instead of one if they're on the battlefield at the start of the hero phase. Then with Warlord Supreme, if the model picked to be your general is a Pretenders hero, they can issue the same command up to three times in the same phase. Now if it does so, each command must be received by a friendly Pretenders unit. No command points are spent the second or third time that your general issues that command in that phase. There are three command traits to choose from. Strongest alone adds one to the hit rolls and wound rolls for the general while they are more than six inches from all other friendly units. Monarch of Lies roll a dice each time an enemy unit receives a command within six inches of his general. On a five plus the command is not received. It does still count as being issued and the command point that was spent to be issued uh, is lost. The last one is Strength of Godhood. If this general issues a command to a different friendly heed nuts of Slanish unit, so not itself, until the end of the turn, improve the Ren characteristic of this general's melee weapons by one, and add one to the damage characteristic of this general's melee weapons. Regalia of the Fightful Air is your artifacts of power for pretenders heroes only. The Crown of Dark Secrets at the start of your hero phase, pick one enemy unit on the battlefield. For the rest of that battle, while the unit is within 6 inches of the bearer, the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapon is 1. Scepter of Domination at the start of the combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 3 inches of the bearer. On a 5+, plus, the strike last effect applies to that unit until the end of that phase. With Breath Taker, pick one of the bearer's melee weapons. If the enemy model is slain by an attack made by that weapon, all effects that would be triggered when that model is slain are ignored. So for example, fight on death. Law of the Magnificent is your spell law for pretenders, wizards, including unique units only. Soul Slice Shards has a casting value of 5 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster and roll 2d6. 
If the role is greater than the unit's bravery characteristic, that unit cannot issue or receive commands until your next hero phase. Phantasmagoria has a casting value of 5 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. Until your next hero phase, each time that unit is picked to fight, you can pick one friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh unit within three inches of that unit. That friendly unit can retreat. Finally, Born of Damnation has a casting value of six. If successfully cast, roll six dice. For each four plus, you receive one depravity point. So if I was running a Pretender's Army, I'm initially drawn to the Strength of Godhood Command Trait, the Crown of Dark Secrets Artifact, and Born of Damnation would be my first spell choice. Strength of Godhood would likely be issuing at least one command like Rally, Redeploy, All at Defense, something else, and it would automatically make my general uh, an extra point of rend and an extra point in damage in melee. Yes, please. The Crown of Dark Secrets could really neuter the chosen enemy unit by reducing its melee attacks to one, or it'll cause that unit to completely avoid your general, which you can play to your advantage. Born of Damnation will top up my depravity to either hit my Revels of Depravity benefit sooner, let me summon some units earlier, or let me summon while keeping those important Revels benefits up. Finally, you've got the God Seekers. Their first command trait is the Thundering Cavalcade, where you can reroll charge rolls for friendly God Seeker units while they're wholly within 12 inches of a friendly God Seeker hero. Maniacal Hunters, at the start of each battle round, before the players receive their starting command points, you can move up to D3 friendly God Seeker units that are more than 3 inches from all enemy units, up to D6 inches. Now roll those separately for each of the units. The units must finish their move more than 3 inches from all enemy units. Of your 3 command traits, with Into the Fray, the Strike First effect applies to this general if they've made a charge move in that turn. Speed Chaser, after this general has made a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this general and roll a number of dice equal to the charge roll for that charge move. For each 4+, plus, that enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. Hunter Supreme is for monster keyword only. Enemy units within 3 inches of this general cannot make pile-in moves if this general has made a charge move in the same turn. In addition, add 1 to the attack characteristic of this general's melee weapons if they've made a charge move in the same turn. Treasures of the Hunt is your artifacts of power for Godseeker heroes only. Cameo of the Dark Prince once per battle at the start of your hero phase, you can say that the bearer will gaze upon the cameo. If you do so until the end of that turn, the bearer can issue commands to friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh units without spending a command point. Threnody's voice box once per battle at the start of the combat phase, you can say that the bearer will play their melody. If you do so until the end of that phase, subtract one from the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by the enemy units within six inches of the bearer to a minimum of one. With Girdle of the Realm Racer, the bearer can fly. In addition, the bearer is eligible to fight in the combat phase if they're within six inches of any enemy units instead of three inches, and they can move an extra three inches when they pile in. Law of the Pursuer is the spell law for the Godseeker heroes only. Path of the Dark Prince has a casting value of five, and if successfully cast, roll 3d6 instead of 2d6, when making a charge roll for the caster until your next hero phase. Progeny of Damnation has a casting value of 5 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh unit that's wholly within range and visible to the caster. Until your next hero phase, if that unit finishes a normal move, run or retreat move within 9 inches of any enemy units, that unit cannot receive the redeploy command. The last spell is Slothful Stupor. It has a casting value of 7 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. Until your next hero phase, the movement characteristic for that unit is 3. And all run rolls and charge rolls for that unit are treated as being 3. 
if I was running God Seekers, I'm initially drawn to Speed Chaser Command Trait, the Girdle of the Realm Racer Artifact, and the Paths of the Dark Prince would be my first spell choice. Speed Chaser gives me another option to deal mortal wounds, although getting a strike first or stopping pile-ins could also be good options. Girdle of the Realm Racer giving my hero a 6-inch pile-in will always be handy, and it will let them get into combat even if they ran, as long as they started their combat within 6 inches of an enemy unit. I want Paths of the Dark Prince for that 3d6 charge. It's an easy spell to cast, and it combines nicely with the reroll charge battle trait ability of the God Seekers. As expected, you've got grand strategies and battle tactics, but there are no Slanesh battalions. Your grand strategies are Coveted Riches, Arch Tempter, Selfish Desires, and Glutton of Depravity. Coveted Riches, you complete the grand strategy if there are no enemy units that have an artifact of power on the battlefield, and there is one or more friendly units that have an artifact of power on the battlefield. Arch Tempter, you will complete this grand strategy if you offer a Temptation Dice to your opponent for the same enemy unit six or more times during the battle. Selfish Desire, you complete the grand strategy if you did not summon any units using the Summon Slanash Demon battle trait during the battle. And Glutton for Depravity, you complete the grand strategy if you have 36 or more unspent depravity points. If I'm picking a grand strategy, I might go for Arch Tempter, but that would require me to offer Temptation Dice to the same unit at least 6 times, Although what's more in my control would be Glutton for Depravity, as long as I make sure that I don't dip below 36 Depravity points if I summon. Your battle tactics are Death by a Thousand Cuts, the Enrapturing Blue, Grand Feast, Excessive Carnage, Realm Races, and Depraved Unity. Death by a Thousand Cuts, pick one enemy unit. You complete this tactic if wounds caused by attacks made by three or more different friendly units were allocated to this unit during the turn. And in Rapturing Blue, pick one enemy hero that has zero wounds allocated to it. You complete this battle tactic if that unit is destroyed in the combat phase of this turn before it is picked to fight. The Grand Feast, you complete the tactic if you have 12 or more depravity points from the Euphoric Killer's battle trait during the turn. Excessive Carnage, pick one enemy unit that is contesting an objective. You complete this tactic if you pick that unit using the Euphoric Killer's battle trait and that unit is destroyed during this turn. Realm Races, you complete if three or more friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh units made a charge move of seven or more during the turn. And Depraved Unity, pick one objective that you do not control. You complete the tactic if you control that objective at the end of this turn, and at least one friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh mortal unit and one friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh demon unit are contesting that objective. Let's look at all your War Scroll changes now, starting with your Faction Terrain, the Fane of Slanesh. The change that I noticed is in Damned Conduit. Now you can still take a Mortal Wound to a hero or sacrifice an artifact to the Fane, but instead of getting plus one to your hit roll, you will gain plus one to your wound roll, which I think we all can agree is a better rule. You can still summon through the power of Slanesh from the Fane, but yeah, the Damned Conduit is the only change that I noticed. Next up is the Keeper of Secrets, and strap yourself in because there are a lot of changes here. It has gained two extra wounds, so it now has 16 wounds. The Living Whip has D6 attacks, it used to be one. The Elegant Great Blade no longer is tied to the damage table, it now has four attacks. It did always have four attacks, but it used to degrade as it took damage. Speaking of damage, the new damage table is 0 to 8, uh, 9 to 10, 11 to 12, and 13 plus. There has been a change with the Ritual Knife. If this unit is armed with a Ritual Knife, at the end of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy model within one inch of this unit that has any wounds allocated to it and roll the dice. On a 2+, plus, that model unit suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to that roll. 
there's been a change in Dark Temptations, and once per turn at the start of the combat phase, if any friendly units with this ability are on the battlefield, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of a friendly unit with this ability. If you do so, your opponent must choose whether that unit resists or receives its temptation. If it resists, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. If it gives in, you gain D3 depravity points. There's a change in the Living Whip ability. If this unit is armed with a Living Whip, at the start of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within six inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, subtract one from the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapon to a minimum of one until the end of that phase. The same unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once per phase. There's been a change in the Shining Aegis, and if this unit is armed with the Shining Aegis, it has a ward of 5+, plus. formerly that was a 6+. Plus. There's been a change in Sinistrous Hand. If the model is armed with a Sinistrous Hand at the end of the combat phase, if any enemy models were slain by wounds caused by this unit's attacks in that phase, you can heal up to three wounds allocated to this unit. If an enemy hero was slain by wounds caused by this unit's attacks in that phase, you can heal up to six wounds allocated to it. It was a D3 or a D6 heal, so it's become way more consistent. The last change is in excess of violence, and once per battle in the combat phase, if any friendly units with this ability are on the battlefield, you can pick one different friendly He Knights of Slanesh unit that is wholly within 12 inches of a friendly unit with this ability, and that has fought for the first time in that phase. That unit can fight for a second time in that phase, and the strike last effect applies to that unit when they fight for the second time. This used to be a command ability, but it wasn't once per battle. Shalaxi Hellbane has also gained two extra wounds, so it's now 16 wounds for Shalaxi as well. The Living Whip D6 attacks is the same as the Keeper. The Soul Piercer is two attacks now. It used to be one. Uh, three plus to hit, it used to be two plus. It's two plus to wound, and it used to be tied to the damage table. D3 plus three damage now. Uh, it used to be D6. The damage table, the Shining Ages, the Living Whip are all the same as the Keeper of Secrets. There's been a change in the Cloak of Constriction. Subtract one from hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons that target this unit. It used to be a plus one to save. There's been a change in Irresistible Challenger, and if a hero can't finish a charge move within half an inch of this model, that hero suffers D3 mortal wounds. The enemy hero's attacks no longer have to target Shalaxi if the challenge is accepted. There was also a change in Refined Senses, and this is a spell with a casting value of 4. If successfully cast until your next hero phase, add 1 to the hit rolls and the wound rolls, for attacks made by the caster that targets an enemy hero, and add one to the save rolls for attacks made by enemy heroes that target the caster. Uh, it gained the plus one to wound, while it kept the plus one to save and plus one to hit. Senesa has had a change in the Staff of Slanesh. It now does flat three or flat six mortal wounds. Now it's still a dice roll against the target unit's armor save, and if the roll is lower than the save, it took D6 mortal wounds, or higher, it was D3. It's just more consistent damage now. It's not a D6, it's just flat 6 or flat 3. There's been a change in the voice of Slanesh. Once per turn, this unit can issue a command to a friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh unit on the battlefield without spending a command point. It did lose the ability to issue command points board wide, and it no longer doubles the Whispers of Doubt or the Parvain of Slanesh spells, but Whispers of Doubt is now just board wide anyway. Speaking of Whispers of Doubt, it is a spell that has a casting value of 6. It has changed. Uh, if the spell is successfully cast, pick one enemy hero that's visible to the caster and roll 3d6. If the roll is equal to or greater than the hero's bravery characteristic, add one to hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks that target that hero until your next hero phase. So it no longer has range as I previously mentioned, and it's now giving you a plus one to your wound rolls too. 
Finally, it's gained the War Master. So in a Heed Knights of Slanesh army, Senesa is a War Master. Which also Dexessa has as well. So Dexessa in a Heed Knights of Slanesh army is a War Master. And the only change that I noticed was in the Scourge of Slanesh. It's now a missile weapon attack. It's the exact same profile as it currently is. It was always a short range attack, but now it's turned into a missile attack. There's been a few changes to Celeste. The Axe of Domination is a 3 plus to hit. It used to be 4. The Scourging Whip is a 3 plus to wound. It was a 4. And it does 2 damage. It used to only do 1. There's been a change in Deadly Symbiosis. You add plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound. If the equal number of Heed Knights of Slanesh Demons and Mortals that are wholly within 18 inches. It used to be a reroll once to hit. It's now plus 1 to hit, plus 1 to wound. There's a change in the Vengeful Allegiance. If the unmodified save roll for an attack made by a melee weapon that targets this unit is a 6, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after all of the attacks have been resolved. It used to be a plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound uh, if they roll the 1 against them in combat. Now you're bouncing back mortal wounds on a save roll of a 6. There's been a change to Subvert. It's a spell with a casting value of 7 and a range of 18. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. That unit cannot issue or receive commands until your next hero phase. This used to limit you to targeting an enemy hero unit only. It did lose the regal authority that gave you a Battleshock immunity for units within 18 inches if this was the general. And Celeste 2 is a war master in a He Knights of Slanesh army. The Vice Leader Herald of Slanesh has changed its Ravaging Claws to be 2 damage, it used to be 1. It gained a rule called Lust for Violence. In the combat phase, when you pick this unit to fight for the first time in that phase, you can pick one friendly Demonet host unit that's wholly within 12 inches of this unit that hasn't fought yet in that phase. This unit and the Demonet host unit can fight one after another in the order of your choice. Finally, there's been a change to the Acquiescence spell. It's a casting value of 5 and a range 18. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit that's within range and visible to the caster. You add 1 to wound rolls for attacks that target that unit until the end of the phase. Now, it used to be reroll hit rolls of 1, and any of the heroes that had the Acquiescence spell, it's exactly the same change. So you might hear me say that a few times, like the Bladebringer Herald on Seeker Chariot, for example, it has Acquiescence. All of them have this updated version. Demonettes have changed. Their piercing claws are now 3 plus to hit. They used to be 4. The Musician has changed. You can now reroll failed Battleshock tests if this unit has the Hornblower. There's been a change to the Standard Bearers, and one in every five models in this unit can either be a Banner Bearer or an Icon Bearer. If they're a Banner Bearer, they can add one to Run Rolls and one to Charge Rolls for this unit if they include a Banner Bearer. With the Icon Bearer, if this unit receives the Rally Command while it has an Icon Bearer, you're now rallying back on a 5 plus instead of a 6 plus. The Banner used to let you reroll your charges, the Icon would let you bring back D6 Demonets on a Battleshock roll of a 1. The only change with the Hell Flayer is in the Soul Scent, and that's going to be the same change that we'll talk about in a moment when I get to the Bladebringer Herald on Hell Flayer. The Contoured Epitome has had two changes, one being the Horrible Fascination. Enemy units within three inches of any friendly unit with this ability cannot issue or receive commands. In addition, enemy units within three inches of any friendly units with this ability cannot retreat. It used to be a 4+, plus, couldn't be targeted in melee. I reckon this is so much better. Overwhelming Acquiescence is a change as well. It's a casting value of 6 and a range of 24. If successfully cast, pick up to D3 different enemy units within range and visible to the caster. Add 1 to wound rolls for attacks that target those units until your next hero phase. This used to cast on a 7 and used to give you reroll 1s against the target unit. Now, again, plus 1 to wound is pretty good. The Infernal Raptress's Inphonic Blast is a 2 plus to wound. It used to be 3s. And there was a change in the Discordant Disruption. 
If a casting roll for an enemy wizard within 24 inches of any friendly unit with this ability is successful, that casting roll must be re-rolled. If the re-rolled casting roll is a double, or one of the dice in the re-rolled casting roll is a 6, that wizard suffers D3 mortal wounds after the effects of the spells have been resolved. So it no longer lets you attempt to dispel an endless spell, and it's gained an extra way of doing mortal wounds to an enemy wizard if they roll a double or they roll a 6 on the re-roll. The mask has had a few changes. The Razor Edge Claws is now 3 plus to wound. It used to be 4 plus. It also does 2 damage where it used to only do 1. The Staff of Masks have changed and it's now a flat plus 3 attacks or 3 healed wounds. So it's no longer a D3 roll. The last change is in the Endless Dance. So after deployment but before the first battle round begins, you can remove this unit from the battlefield. If you do so, set this unit up again anywhere within your opponent's territory, more than three inches from all enemy units. This used to be a six inch pile in and a bunch of re-rolls depending on the targets. Now it's just straight up like the Lawmaster almost, where you just basically pick it up, put it on the battlefield anywhere in your opponent's territory, so long as you don't starting them in combat. The Bladebringer Herald on Seeker Chariot has had the Flensing Whips to damage two. It used to be one. The Piercing Claws is now four attacks. It used to be three. I mentioned earlier the Acquiescence spell has changed. Casting value of five, range 18. If successful, pick an enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. Add one to the wound rolls for attacks that target that unit until your next hero phase. It also gained a rule called Thrill Seeker. When friendly Seeker Chariot units are wholly within 12 inches of any friendly unit with this ability, add one to the number of mortal wounds caused by the Mutilating Blades ability. Speaking of the Seeker Chariots, we have Piercing Claws also going up to four attacks where it used to be three, and we'll talk about those Mutilating Blades. So after this unit finishes a charge move, roll a dice for each enemy unit within one inch of this unit. On a 2+, plus, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. The Bladebringer Herald on Hellflayer has its Ravaging Claws changed to 2 damage where it used to be 1. Soul Scent has gained some extra text, and that is if the enemy unit has 10 or more models, both of the effects of this ability are triggered on 3+, plus instead. So it still does the D3 mortal wounds on a 4+, plus for each enemy unit within 1 inch, Except if there's 10 or more models, it's now a 3+. plus. It's gained a rule called Slavering for Sensation. While friendly Hellflayer units are wholly within 12 inches of any friendly units with this ability, add one to the roll that determines whether the Soul Scent ability causes any mortal wounds. Finally, Acquiescence has changed exactly the same as the Bladebringer Herald on Seeker Chariot we've already spoken about. Seekers have had two changes. The Musician and the Standard Bearer are the same as the Demonettes. We spoke about that earlier. You can reroll fail Battleshock tests for the unit if it has a Hornblower, and you get plus one to your run and charge rolls, and you get the five up rally depending on if you take the banner or the icon. The other change is in the Soul Hunters. At the end of the combat phase, if any enemy models with a wounds characteristic of two or less were slain by wounds caused by this unit's attacks in that phase, add one to the attack characteristic of that unit's piercing claws for the rest of the battle. So the change here is it used to not have the restriction of having two wounds or less, but the boost only used to last until your next combat phase. Now you gain that boost for the rest of the battle. The Bladebringer Herald on Exalted Chariot also had its Flensing Whips changed to be Damage 2. There's a change in Excess of Blades. After this unit finishes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the charge roll for that charge move. For each roll that is greater than the enemy unit save characteristic, that unit suffers one mortal wound. It lost the Pungent Soul Scent ability, which in combat used to deal D3 mortal wounds and it would gain extra attacks, but it did gain the Soul Gorges. This unit can issue the same command up to two times in the same phase. If it does so, each command must be received by a friendly Exalted Chariot unit. No command point is spent the second time this unit issues the command in that phase. And Acquiescence has changed like we've spoken about already. 
The Exalted Chariot's Flensing Whips is damage 2 as well. Excess of Blades is the same as Bladebringer Herald on Exalted Chariot. It too lost the Pungent Soul Scent. It did gain a rule called Bitter Frenzy. Now roll a dice each time this unit receives a command from a friendly Bladebringer Exalted Chariot unit. On a 4+, plus, you get to add 1 to the damage characteristic of this unit's Flensing Whips until the end of that turn. With your fiends, there's been a change in the deadly pincers. They are now three attacks. They used to be four, but they do D3 damage where they used to only do one damage. The barb stinger has changed as well. It's now rend minus two. It used to only be rend minus one. There's been a change in the soporific musk. Subtract one from hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons that target this unit. So the minus one to wound only used to happen when you had four or more fiends, so that restriction really is just removed. It did lose the crushing grip, which was D3 damage on the pincer if you rolled a six to wound. Next up, we have our brand new hero, the Lord of Hubris. Utterly enamored by their own magnificence, the strutting peacocks known as the Lord of Hubris swagger into battle, loudly demanding that the enemy's finest face them in single combat. Those foolish enough to answer the challenge are cut to ribbons in a matter of seconds. Now the Lord of Hubris is 135 points, and for your cash you get a movement 6, save a 5+, plus, bravery of 7, and 5 wounds. It has 1 melee profile and no missile attacks. The Exquisite Scimitar has a range of 1, you get 5 attacks, it hits on a 3, it wounds on a 3, it's rend 1 for 2 damage. With you first, I insist this unit has a ward of 4+. plus. In addition, at the end of the charge phase, you can pick 1 enemy unit within 1 inch of this unit, and say that the Lord of Hubris will give them a chance to strike first. If you do so, the strike first effect applies to that unit in the following combat phase, but all of the attacks must target this unit. Only the best will suffice. At the start of the combat phase, you can pick one friendly Painbringers or Twin Souls unit that's wholly within 12 inches of any friendly unit with this ability. If you do so until the end of that phase, each time a model in this unit is slain, it can fight immediately, then it's removed from play. The key words that the Lord of Hubris has is Chaos, Heed Knights of Slanesh, Mortal, Slanesh, Hero, Lord of Hubris. Moving on to our mortals, we'll start off with Glutos. Glutos has gained the Leer Staff of Lothshar Missile Weapon. It's a range of 12, 1 attack, hits on a 2, wounds on a 2, no rend for 6 damage. That's right, 6 damage. There's been a change in the Flaying Scourge. It's range 2 and 3 attacks. It used to only be 2. The Sacrificial Dagger hits and wounds have been swapped. It used to hit on 4s, wound on 3s. Now it hits on 3s, wounds on 4s. The Crushing Claw range is now range 2. Uh, it has 5, 4, 3, or 2 attacks, depending on how you are going on the damage table. And it's Rend minus 2. It used to only be Rend minus 1. There has been a change in the Grand Gourmand. Uh, the round one bravery boost is now wholly within 12 inches. It used to be six inches for your He Knights of Slanesh mortals. And then the other change is in round four. It no longer can replace a spell, but it does gain an extra unbind. And this goes along with the existing plus one extra spell cast. It did lose the Leer Staff of Lothshar's ability, which was a plus one to cast, dispelling and unbinding rolls. There was a change in the Gorge of Excess, and at the start of your hero phase, you can pick one friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh mortal unit that's wholly within 12 inches of this unit. If you do so until your next hero phase, each time that unit fights, after all of its attacks have been resolved, you can heal up to a number of wounds allocated to that unit, equal to the number of wounds and mortal wounds caused by those attacks that were allocated to an enemy unit to a maximum of six. This used to be a command ability and it used to be based on the damage that Glutos used to deal. It did lose the abilities of the Priestess, the Lashmir and the Painbringer. It did gain the Blessing of the Dark Prince. This unit has a ward of five plus. There's only one change to Fabio, I mean Sigvold, and that is the Shard Slash, and he's now doing two damage, 
where it used to do D3. The Shard Speaker of Slanesh has had a change in the Haze Staff. It's now 4 plus to wound. It used to be a 3, and it does damage 2, where it used to do D3. The Shadow Cloak Claws is 5 attacks. It used to be 4. Ren minus 1 used to be Ren minus 2. And 2 damage, it used to be 1. There's a change in Mist Lurkers, and if this unit successfully casts a spell that is not unbound, until your next hero phase, it gains the Shadow Cloak Claws weapon profile above, and it can attack with that melee weapon. In addition, this unit has a ward of 4+, plus until your next hero phase. It used to give you plus 1 save, but no ward, so I guess a ward is better than a plus 1 to save, right? There's been a change to the Twisted Mirror. Once per turn in your shooting phase, you can pick one enemy unit within 9 inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a 4+, plus, subtract 1 from save rolls for attacks that target that unit until your next hero phase. And the same unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once per turn. This used to give you plus 1 to your wound rolls for attacks that target that unit. There's also been a change in the Reflection Eternal. It's a spell that has a casting value of 6 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. Subtract one from the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapon to a minimum of one until your next hero phase. This spell used to make your enemy minus one to wound. Your Bliss Barb Seeker bows have changed and they are now range of 12 inches. They used to be range 18. The Sibrite Blade is a 3 plus to hit, it used to be 4, and the Poison Tongue is a 4 plus to wound, it used to be 3 plus. There's been a change in Vectors of Agony. If any wounds caused by attacks made by missile weapons by this unit are allocated to an enemy unit, subtract 1 from save rolls for attacks that target that unit until the end of that turn. The same unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once per turn. Uh, it used to be on sixes to wound, you deal a mortal wound. The Bliss Barb Archers have seen the Bliss Barb Bow and the Sybarite Blade now both hit on threes. They used to hit on fours. Otherwise, no change on the Bliss Barb Archers. Your Lord of Pain has had a change in the Share the Pain. This unit has a ward of four plus. In addition, each time a wound or a mortal wound is caused by an attack made with a melee weapon is negated by this ability, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound. It used to be a 5+, plus, so the ward has gotten better, and it should reflect a few more mortal wounds. There's also been a change in the Paragon of Pain. Add 1 to hit rolls and wound rolls for friendly Heed Knights of Slanesh mortal units that are wholly within 12 inches of this unit while this unit is contesting an objective. The Myrmidish Painbringers have had a change and they now have a save of 3+. plus. It used to be 4+. plus. The Wicked Scimitar is 3 attacks. It used to be 2 attacks. It's gained an ability called the Paragons of Battle, and you get to add one to the save rolls for attacks that target this unit while it's wholly within enemy territory, or while it's wholly within 12 inches of an objective that you do not control. It did lose the Painbringer Shield ability, which used to give you plus one to save in melee, but that's just been incorporated to the characteristic, and now that it's a characteristic enhancement rather than a plus one to your save, it means you're going to benefit more from Mystic Shield and all that defense and cover. It did also lose the Dance of the Wailing Blade, and that used to do mortal wounds on sixes to hit. The Simbrash Twin Souls have had a change. Their movement is now 6. It used to be 8. The uh, Merciless Blades is now range of 1. It used to be 2. Uh, it's 2 attacks. It used to be 3. Uh, hits on a 3. Wounds on a 4. Those have swapped. Uh, and it's now Rend minus 1 where it never used to have Rend before. It did lose the Fractured Souls, and that was at the start of the hero phase. You picked one of two abilities, and each battle round you had to pick a different ability. You've gained a new ego-driven excess, and you subtract one from the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by enemy units to a minimum of one, while they're within three inches of any friendly unit with this ability. You've also gained a new version of the Fiendish Reflexes, and this unit has a ward of 5+, plus, while it's within three inches of any enemy units. 
It's worth noting that both ego-driven excess and fiendish reflexes were the name of old rules under the Fractured Souls. Ego-driven excess used to be re-roll hits in melee and fiendish reflexes didn't have the conditions of being within three inches, but you get to use them every turn. Um, but like I said, Fractured Souls gone. You just get these two new abilities all the time. Your Hell Striders with Claw Spears, the Claw Spears are now a range of two. They used to be one, and they are two attacks each. They used to be one. The Musician and the Standard Bearer are the same as the Demonets. We know reroll fail Battleshock test for the Musician, and plus one to run and charge, or five up rally, depending on banner or icon. You've lost the Piercing Strikes, which used to give you plus one damage on the charge, but you have gained a new rule called the Jagged Weapon Limbs. If this unit is within three inches of any enemy unit at the start of the charge phase, add one to the attack characteristic and damage characteristic of this unit's claw spears in the following combat phase. The Hell Striders with the Hell Scourges, the Musician and the Standard Bearer are again exactly the same as the Demonettes, and the change is in the Hooked Tendrils. Now, enemy models with a wounds characteristic of one or two cannot contest objectives while they're within three inches of any friendly unit with this ability. There's been a couple of changes with the Slick Blade Seekers. The Slick Blade Glaive is now Rend of minus two. The Poison Tongue is now doing a three plus two wound. It's had a change in Unrivaled Velocity, and this unit can run and still charge later in the turn. This used to be reroll charges. And there's been a change in decapitating strikes. Add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's slick blade glaives if the target unit has a wound characteristic of three or less. Uh, it used to be a mortal wound on sixes with the glaive. The dread pageant is now gained two wounds each. They used to only be one wound each. There's been a change on the Bliss Barb Bow. It's now three plus to hit. Uh, the slick blade is now range of two and rend minus two. The Dread Harpoon is now caused the Agonizing Spear, and it does 2 damage where it used to be D3. Uh, and also the Deadliest Procession has changed. Once per battle, at the end of the charge phase, you can say that this unit will draw upon its combined experience. If you do so, the Strike First effect applies to this unit in the following combat phase. If you've been keeping up with the Beasts of Chaos, you would have seen the Slangle Fiend Bloods have had a glow up. Uh, the War Scroll, from what I can see, is exactly the same as the one that is in the Beasts of Chaos, other than it's keyworded to Hid Knights of Slanesh rather than keyworded Beasts of Chaos. If you've missed that update, uh, the Razor Sharp Claws is now four attacks. Yeah, that's plus one attack, and it has two damage. The slaughter at any cost has changed, and at the end of any phase, if any wounds or mortal wounds were allocated to this unit in that phase, and this unit is more than 9 inches from all enemy units, this unit can move up to D6. The last change, and the one that I love the most, is the obsessive violence, and once per battle in the combat phase, after this unit has fought for the first time in that phase, you can say that it will continue its obsessive onslaught. If you do so, this unit can fight for the second time in that phase, and the strike last effect applies when they fight for the second time. The final change before we get to points is in your endless spells. Uh, the Mesmerizing Mirror has had a change in gaze, not into its depths. At the end of the movement phase, roll six dice for each unit within six inches of his endless spell. For each six, that unit's commanding player must choose whether that unit's gazing into its mirror or resisting the temptation. If it resists the temptation, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. If it gazes into the mirror, the player who summons the endless spell is going to gain D3 depravity points. Now, this ability has no effect on Heed Knights of Slanesh units. Uh, the Wheel of Excruciation has changed and the casting range has doubled. It used to be casting range of 6, now it's casting range of 12. Uh, the Dreadful Visage has had a change in the Terrifying Entity. The plus 1 Bravery characteristic boost has just changed to the Heed Knights of Slanesh. It's no longer keyword, just Slanesh. Plenty of War Scrolls have changed, so it makes sense that we will also see some points change. 
You saw some points discounts on the Contorted Epitome going down 50 points. The Bliss Barb Seekers, the Dreadful Visage, the Hell Flayer, and the Slick Blade Seekers have gone down 10 points. The Shard Speaker of Slanesh and Sigvold has gone down 5 points. But there were plenty of points going up as well. The Lord of Pain went up 5. The Bliss Barb Archers, the Seekers, the Twin Souls, Senesa, and the Vice Leader Herald of Slanesh all went up 10 points. Demonets went up 15 points. The Bladebringer Herald on Exalted Chariot, Dexessa, the Fiends of Slanesh, the Hell Striders with Claw Spears, the Hell Striders with Hell Scourges, the Keeper of Secrets, and the Mask all went up 30 points. The Painbringers, the Slangor, and the Dread Pageant all went up 35 points. The Bladebringer Herald on Hellflayer, the Bladebringer Herald on Seeker Chariot, and Glutos all went up 40 points. Celeste went up 45 points. Uh, Shalaxi went up 90 points. And if you missed it, your new unit, the Lord of Hubris, is 135 points. I think it's fair to say that Slanesh has finally paid for the sins of the past. There is plenty to like in the new Heed Knights of Slanesh Battle Tome that keeps up with a lot of the old Slanesh themes. I really, really, really like the Temptation Dice mechanic. It's going to bring a bunch of fun interactivity within the game. Do you accept the dice and generate depravity points? Do I decline them and take mortal wounds? You've kept the revel in depravity rules from White Dwarf and the ability to summon is still in the army, but it's not the sole focus on how you win your games. You did lose some of your popular builds like Lured Haze Invaders, and you can no longer get those Exploding Sixes to hit through the Allegiance abilities. And to no surprise, we saw plenty of units being tweaked, some being aggressively tweaked like the Keeper of Secrets, and some got some very interesting rules being added. And because of all these rules tweaks, you have seen points mostly go up across the board. But that's enough from me because you know that I'm going to go into a much deeper dive with the faction with some experienced players in the very near future. I want to hear from you in the meantime. Let me know in the comments section what you're thinking so far. Has there been some War Scroll changes that makes you want to include them into your list? Is there some new features like allegiance abilities, spells, enhancements, whatever it might be? Is there something that has maybe had a glow up? Maybe something that's going to go on holidays for a little bit? Let me know. I'd be curious to hear from you what your take was from this video. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you press like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord, and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.